I had notes up yet, but this is Don Weber, and he's going to be talking about some pretty cool stuff here in a couple moments. He's been a member of the BHIS family on and off for the last, geez, I've been here five years. I've seen your name in and out of our systems for that whole time. So, you know, another member it's, of the BHIS family. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah, that's good. It's good to know people. So, I don't think I have a presenter, though. Do I present? Oh, you. We'll get to you over, Yeah. We'll get you over, Don. Here we go. Boom. Oh, TJ's on Boom. it. Too late. I can do something. PowerPoint. You guys don't want to see Discord, right? So we can just uh, just have an infinite loop of. It's <laughs> a good question. Oh, yeah. Whoa, this looks interesting, Look. doesn't it? Look. There we go. Very nice. I need to expense another. Uh, hey, CJ, can we get another uh, hack RF1? I have one hack RF1. I want a better antenna. I'll get you an antenna if I can ever. Have... Wait, that's not. I want a hamburger. I what want a just... cheeseburger. You get. I, I was doing all this. I was doing this research, and you know, and I was. I'm fortunate enough to have purchased a hack RF1. Uh, I do have a the the old jawbreaker that I used to use as well. But I was just looking at it, going, okay, maybe, maybe I, maybe I need a Lime SDR, and and maybe I, and I was like, no, finish the work. <laughs> <laughs> Stop Is shopping. One? Is that interesting enough for analyzing Bluetooth, right? The Ubertooth, is that what's called? Yeah, I think it's called the Ubertooth one. Uh, yeah. So uh, the Ubertooth is a um, hardware ra radio specific for analyzing the Bluetooth. Uh, Technologies, uh, uh, BLE, and, and and so forth. So that would be specific to that. Uh, those types of transmissions uh, with other radios, you can certainly uh, capture. But uh, interacting with the actual protocol and so forth, you need something. Uh, you need a a hardware radio to do some of those things. And Mike Osman put out the uh, Ubertooth. He's also put out the uh, Yardstick Stick One, oh, uh, which oh, is yeah. a redesign of a yeah. uh, TI development board that we use to uh, um, start some of our research in the 900 megahertz range as well so he's he's done a lot and and obviously he's the one that is uh, um, puts out the uh, the hack rf he and uh, at great scott's gadgets so you know none of this would have been heck half of the things that i do wouldn't have been possible without mike so that's amazing very cool can you say that name one more time mike osman at Thank great you. scott gadgets Yes. Got it. Research time. Yeah, I, I stand on the shoulder of giants or right on their coattails, whichever one you, you want to say. So. We say this, that too. I think everybody in this industry. This is starting Absolutely. to fall into that, uh, that business bullshit bingo card thing where you say synergy or value adder. <laughs> shoulders, giants. Shoulders, no. giant shoulders. Although at least in machine that. learning. Well, I mean, that's, it is. that's why I'm associated with Black Hills, right? I mean, I, I need to, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm riding the wave. <laughs> Dude, we're standing on your shoulders. It's the other way around. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I know. We pretend to be this gigantic shop of brilliant minds, but it's all the brilliant minds that come hang out with us that, like, I, I don't know. It's, oh, it's absolutely. All. You know, it's, it, you know, my, uh, uh, I, I, I just do it all the time. You know, code reuse. Uh, um, uh, research reuse. It's, you know, why, why reinvent everything? I mean, certainly that's, you know, I didn't develop universal hack, a radio hacker. I, I use it for my own gains, you know, whether it's, uh, to do research on my own or whether it's to, uh, uh, to, uh, assist clients with things, you know, I, I didn't develop a hack RF. I mean, really it's just the methodology around this, uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today is some of the methodology that I use these tools to help me understand things and help clients do uh, um, ensure that they're doing things correctly. So that's pretty much, yeah, I would love to develop, you know, spend time developing tools like this, updating them, uh, uh, fixing uh, uh, things that uh, I would hope that would be included in it. Um, I do some of that when I can. And uh, other times I just kind of put it out there and say, hey, we need this and see who's going to step Somebody up. Help. So. Don, what percentage of your time do you think you get to do that kind of work? Like, would you estimate? Um, are you talking specifically about radio research and uh, radio no, interaction with clients? That kind of that that development of tools, kind of research that you're talking about in general. Well, in in the last year and a half, uh, 
I've been able to do more just because I've been back into the um, actual assessment uh, research uh, part of the industry. Uh, when I was uh, the three years before that, when I was a uh, senior manager for incident response, you know, I, I was leading a team and, you know, and I was setting direction and uh, providing guidance to leadership. And I don't, it, you know, I, I wrote a few scripts to do some threat hunting and, and so forth. But, you know, when it, when it comes down to your day to day job, it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, and I, and I look back at a, uh, you know, and so when I, I try to remind myself, you know, and to to do those things and I watch people like, you know, Ed Scotus and Josh Wright and them saying that, hey, I'm devoting an, an hour a week, to, even if it's just an hour to, to do these types of things, whether it's something that I'm interested in and whether it's something I love or it's I want to keep a skill set going, you have to set time aside. And hopefully, you know, organizations are allowing their team members to do that certainly that's one of the things that i told my team hey you know you, i don't mind if you take up to three hours a week you know i want you to do that to sit down and you know practice your skills whether it's threat hunting in our environment or just researching new technologies you you have to sit down and do that because there's just too many domains now to keep to keep up with yeah that's, so that's a conversation sally and i had and it gets tiring because of the number of domains and the different directions you can take research in these fields we, you know, kind of step into and then out of. And it's. Oh, yeah. You know, it, and it used to be a breadth of, you know, I mean, I, I used to. Uh, and Tim Medin hates this when I say this. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades. And, you know, <laughs> and I like to say that and it used to be a lot easier to say, you know, I, I have a breadth of knowledge and I dive deep into specific things that. Uh, I'm either dealing with at that time and or for you know my interest or a client but you know the the it just it I mean there's a reason why I moved to an iPhone away from an Android phone because I was sick of you know devoting so many times screwing with it and and not really like you know I, I'd root it and then not go anywhere else and I was just like okay I'm just I'm, if I get an iPhone I'm not going to screw with it and I can focus on other things and and stop <laughs> doing a little bit of research here and there so yeah fair enough do you have a workshop we were supposed to introduce a workshop and i'm not sure which one our notes uh, aren't real clear on this oh oh what of of what we're actually talking about well no 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 no. do you are you participating in any of these workshops like specifically online virtual discord based workshop channels oh like today um, for this event is that yeah. what you're talking about uh, well, here's, no, here's my 30-second spiel. I can, I can probably make it 10 seconds. Everyone paying attention here in track two, go check out the workshops. There are some coming up. Register, check them out, find something to do. And again, here's Don. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Aside. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing a workshop. I was actually hoping that this would kick off. Uh, I would do something that is interactive with this i mean that was when i first thought about this i was like okay hey what am i going to do for wild west hacking fest this year i would i really wanted to do something that was technical that required me to do some research but also that people could you know if they really really wanted to play along i didn't get as far obviously we're all remote now so i didn't bring any radios with me to to transmit things it's going to be difficult for people to uh, um to play along, but hopefully the way I've set it up, it you can eventually play along if you want to. You'll see that in just a second when I get to the slides. Also, I'm gonna this is technical. This is a technical talk. I'm not I'm not gonna tell too many war stories. I've only got a short amount of time to get through this massive presentation, but there will be uh, some interactive gifts where you actually my goal is to show people how to use Universal Radio Hacker so that you can have a starting point to do this type of research if you're interested in it. But also, you know, the and, and this is me kind of tossing the ball up there. You know, I am doing this for or hope to do this for some of my clients. I work in the industrial control system industries and they are deploying radios that uh, manage their processes. And a part of what I want to do is I want to demonstrate that we can capture this information. We can analyze it to understand potentially what they're doing. And if I'm successful and they haven't set up security configuration correctly, I might be able to have 
an effect on that process. In other words, shut something down or tell it to do something. And that would be bad in many areas, you know, and it really depends on the area. So uh, this is me. Go ahead. We're happy you're here. We're going to give you the floor. We're going to give you the floor. Have oh. at it. And I'm uh, sorry. I, I thought I had the floor. So. No, oh, no, no, no. We're not hanging out with you. We're, we're just, we're listening to your intro and this yeah, is fantastic. Absolutely. So well, I have one okay, last question. Awesome. Is this a, is oh, this an please. upgrade from GNU radio? GNU so radio? Th this is, this is built on, uh, 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 this is built on the packages that are associated with GNU radio. The, and, and I have given talks before on this and when I got introduced to Universal Radio Hacker, you know, I was used to built, pulling in all of the components. And certainly you want to do that. You want to know how to use GNU Radio. You want to be able to pull all the components in. So doing the research we do today, understanding how to do that with the individual components is important. I've put research out there and blog posts and so forth on how to do that. Uh, but the, the amount of time it took me to do this stuff in, uh, um, in the... Uh, new radio companion was uh, a weeks just to set things up and whereas so radio hacker allows me to just you know quickly grab packets do some quick analysis see if i got a, a nice clean pack capture if i haven't restarted again instead of going through and and you know tweaking every single module just right to ensure that i've uh, can analyze the packets. So it, this makes it much easier to do that. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, 100%. Sir, you have the awesome. virtual floor. Looking forward to it. Wow. I appreciate it. Thank you very, thank you very much. Let me resize my window right there. Don't need my face so big. All right. Hopefully everybody is uh, um, can hear me. I, I assume that that you can. Thank you very much for. I am on Discord, but I, I'm not really monitoring it. I'm not even sure I'm in the right room, so I apologize for that. I've got a lot to go over, and I want to make sure that I get through it all. Talk a, a little fast, but certainly, hopefully, you can keep up. And I do have some resources that are going to be available to you that you can go download for those of you that. Uh, want to uh, play along or want to to catch up but uh, um, as i mentioned uh, you know don weber i want to talk to you uh, to everybody about uh, universal radio hacker how to use it to capture and analyze communications whether it's uh, you know just in your neighborhood you want to understand what's being transmitted there's constantly things that are flying around us all the time being able to capture that and look into it is one thing I certainly, I, I use it for uh, doing analysis for clients and understanding how their radio technologies, their implementation, ensuring that they've implemented it correctly and hopefully safely, because it is important for critical infrastructure or whatever they're doing. Okay, let me make sure. My mouse is kind of big. Hopefully you guys can see my mouse. I believe you can go to webinar. Um, I might be using it to point things out later. But uh, let's get started. So who am I? I work for Cutaway Security. Uh, we do security assessments within the ICS industry. Mostly that is like actual security assessments and not necessarily penetration testing because of the production environments and the risks that it presents there. So understanding how to do security in there is, uh, is really important. And I do it so that you know, I'm, I'm trying to help you know, make the world a safer place. And it's, uh, uh, it's really important to me. Uh, we also do uh, at Cutaway Security, we do penetration testing in normal environments as well. And also, as you're going to see here, some security research into the technologies specifically around the industrial control system environments. I do teach for SANS. I teach the ICS 410 ICS SCADA Security Essentials class. And so you'll see, you know, I, I make references to the teams a lot. And so you'll see that in there. I also teach the uh, um, hosted class uh, through. Uh, Control Things IO, which is the assessing and exploiting control systems class. That is usually a hosted class at SANS, although we do teach it outside of the SANS curriculum. It's not necessarily the same as a SANS class. But Don Weber, I, me personally, I've been in the security field since 2002 after I got out of the Marine Corps. I've had held a gambit of jobs from a security manager, incident response manager, 
but also doing penetration testing and security research. And I've been focusing on the ICS industry for about 10 years uh, since, the, well, yeah, it's about 10 years now. Want to give some special thanks. You know, obviously I talked about the SANS team and that, that is extremely important to me. They're, uh, the, they're a good team and they are trying to make the, the world a safer place. So the SANS ICS team is, plays an important role in everything that I do. And, you know, so if you're looking to get into this industry, look at the resources that we've put out there associated with that program and it's good. But this presentation itself would not have been possible without the generous input from the ICS Village. ICS Village provides a, uh, um, a, a lot of technologies, configured technologies, so that when we're going out to different conferences, a lot of times you'll find the ICS Village there and you'll see that we've got the technologies deployed in a manner that allow you to understand it. You can actually plug into their interfaces and interact with them. And a part of what I'm trying to do is here is input some radio technologies into that because we do find it in our control environments. And when you see the equipment that uh, I'm using to uh, grab and analyze uh, data, radio transmissions, it, you're going to see that it's actual devices that would de be deployed within an ICS network so that we can demonstrate impact on the process. And that's the goal. So thank you very much. Shout out to uh, Thomas Van Norman and the rest of the ICS Village team. I really appreciate your input for this. Do you want to give this disclaimer? We're not going to talk about vulnerabilities today. We're going to talk about potential vulnerabilities if you implement the technologies incorrectly, either from a client standpoint, or you're deploying these within your environment. Vendors can make choices for how they allow things to be configured or how they've implemented different technologies within their devices. Uh, hey, Doc, this really is quick, the yes. Really quick, sir. We're thinking maybe the slides aren't moving forward, so maybe try to unshare and reshare, and we'll see if they get caught up. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry about that. It does say paused in there. Oh, hang on, hang on. Go. Uh, you should see him moving right now. That looks good. We do. All right. I apologize that for everybody. And yeah, so we did cover that ICS Village. Thank you very much, Tom. This is where I was at the disclaimer. Uh, the so I, I'm not going to put out vulnerabilities about any of these devices. It's you know we have vo vulnerable implementations, and we'll talk about that. If you do want to play along. You know, as I mentioned, I wanted to make this interactive as much as possible. As you see the slide, as we start getting into the, you know, using URH, we will, there will be GIFs on, on the slides to, uh, to kind of show you, demonstrate how to do certain techniques. Uh, but I've, you know, taken all of that and put that into a, an iMove me, iMovie, excuse me, and I've put that up on, my, on the, the Cutaway Security website. This is the link that you can get to it. Sorry, you can't cut and paste it. And, and I don't want to pause to put it in Discord. But we can certainly, if somebody can type that into Discord for everybody else, that, that would be appreciated. That way you have it. But you can go download the presentation. You can download this iMovie, which is uh, I, I consolidated all of the uh, slides for the analysis that we're going to cover in just a few minutes. and. I have also put the captures that you'll see in here. I've put those up there so that you can start up URH. You don't even need a radio to, to you know, do the captures. I've created the captures for you, and you can redo all of this analysis that, we talked of, that we'll talked that we talk about in here if you go download that. So why are we here? The you know, radios can be deployed in ICS environments they, to provide connectivity to certain endpoints, whether it's for view, which is just getting information from sensors, or whether it's for control, meaning that we send a command to make a change to an actuator, such as a motor or a pipe or, or something to take action within that process. And all of that is those commands that information is being transmitted wirelessly. Okay, so. It, we will see that out there. 
as you can see, there's uh, we've got the controllers with the actual uh, radio antennas on them. That's the radio itself. It's just a module that's about you know one inch. Everything else that's connected to it are different input output modules that do direct I/O, which is just could be digital, could be analog, or it could be some smart I/O such as Modbus or some other protocol as well going over these connections. And that information is being transmitted and you'll be able to pick it up. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. A part of what I want to demonstrate, you know, and my goal associated with this research, whether it's for a client or whether it's to help people understand what the, the proper way to do things, is if you're deploying those technologies, if you're deploying those radios, it's kind of difficult to get things set up. And when you're initially deploying them, the security settings are going to be turned off. In other words, the, the uh, Phoenix contact radios that we're going to be looking at today, they do provide s some security settings for, uh, to prevent uh, disruption, but also to secure the information that's being passed. Uh, we can see here on the left-hand side of the slide where they talk about how they use frequency hopping spread spectrum that helps with uh, to prevent uh, jamming and of the transmissions. They also provide the capabilities of 128-bit data encryption uh, via AES, and that's to secure the, the data. But as we can see on the right-hand side, the default configuration for this is that the encryption is turned off. Okay. And when it's complicated, when it's uh, convoluted to implement this technology, especially within uh, uh, environments that uh, that are difficult for transmission, you might get it set up and working and then just deploy it in that state. And unfortunately, that would mean that you're deploying it without encryption. So we want to help people understand the, the risk around that so they can make good decisions for implementation. Now, there's three internal truths. I get this from the, the, the SANS class and also from the control things, IO classes uh, that I teach. We, we teach this in there. Denial of service is always possible, okay? And it's, it's almost impossible to defend. So when you're thinking about denial of service, you are thinking about jamming. But then, you know, also for these radios, to think about the protocol type uh, disruptions that we would see in a Wi-Fi network, uh, disassociation and so forth. Some implementations may or may not provide that capabilities, and we need to do analysis on that to see if that's true. Network capture is always possible. This is a public, wireless is public network, and we're, we're all well aware of that. We need people to understand that. Even if it, we're doing some type of uh, protection, such as frequency hopping, doesn't mean that we can't get a hold of that information, and you'll see that in just a second. And then finally, attackers will always have a limited capability to interact with our networks. In other words, we can send packets. So anybody can send packets. The radios will try to an analyze them. It'll, if it's not for it, it will drop that, hopefully. And if it is sent in a way that it starts processing the data, then we can interact with that radio, even if it drops it later, if it doesn't like the information that we're passing to it, we've gotten it to process it. And that could be a stepping stone for attackers to uh, take advantage of our radio networks. We teach those three eternal truths. And then when I was talking about this the other day, Tim Conway, who leads the uh, SANS ICS team, he's like, Don, you need to tell people this. And, expect, and this is more important for the people in the industrial control systems arena who are actually implementing these technologies and this is his warning to those people if your process can't live without these radios to be a part you know to be passing information as far as control and or just the regular vision if they can't operate without that then you need to consider some other technologies so it's definitely important that people understand that you know we're going to talk about how we can analyze it and potentially communicate with those processes, and that could be a risk to your environment. So I'm going to teach you guys the secret sauce for doing security assessments associated with radio security within any environment. Okay, and we don't even really need to do our capture and analysis for this to help people, to help improve the situation uh, for an organization. 
First, we just need to find the radio configuration files. And then we need to search on some type of term that's associated with the configuration that uh, we are concerned about. In this case, we would be concerned about encryption for the from the Phoenix contact documentation. I know that that's a security setting. So I would search on the word encryption in their configuration files. I'm going to note the results. If I am a, an implementer, then I would make modifications as appropriate there. And then we're going to do something. We don't know what it is, and we're going to profit. Well, in the case of Phoenix Contacts uh, uh, radios, I will get the configuration files from the uh, from my client. I'll do a search string. I'm going to be on a Windows system because that's what's required for this. I mean, you can export it to another system, but I'm going to do it right there on the Windows system. I'm going to search for, I'm going to use the select string dash pattern encryption, so searching for the word encryption, and then noting the output. And you can see in the uh, image right there, but uh, configuration without encryption and then a configuration with encryption. So, and, and this is important to note, not only from an assessment standpoint, but this is what attackers are gonna be looking for. These files, these configuration of files are what attackers go after when they're on the network. They try to find the devices where these configuration files are stored and they will review it for this type of information. They will, if the uh, encryption key is in plain text, they will note it to try to use it to their advantage. The like, what is step four? What do we do here? And then we get the profit. Well, that's those question marks in my mind. It are, always mean either reporting or documentation. If we're doing security assessment, we want to report and report this stuff properly. If you're a, a client that's implementing this, you want to document the situation as well. So here's the uh, wireless radio assessment methodology that uh, we teach as SANS and as a part of the. Uh, control things. This actually comes from a research that was performed associated with the smart grid industry, and uh, we've just incorporated it into our training. As you can see there, the image on the left-hand side of the slide, we're going to capture, do analysis of uh, how that information was transmitted, such as the spread spectrum modulation that it was sent. Once we get that, once we understand that, we can use that information to create a bit stream and convert that to a packet. And then once we have a packet, now we can create our own packets and interact, transmit those. Okay, so that would be a normal methodology. Okay, as you can see here, uh, when we talk about this analysis in using Universal Radio Hacker, this software tool to interact with things, you're going to uh, see that uh, I do research on the target. And in other words, I need to gather information first I, I need to determine the best piece of equipment to uh, use to interact with those uh, with this technologies. We were talking earlier about using the, the HackRF for radio analysis, but when we want to do something specific to a certain protocol like Bluetooth or Zigbee or something, we need radios that actually are configurable to integrate with those technologies. And so that would be the hardware that I would select if I was working with those. In the case of doing research and in uh, for implementation, understanding implementation, we do want to set these things up in a lab so we can simulate our targets. And you'll see representations of that you already have in some of the images that I put in there. But for this, I set up my simulated targets and then I would transmit, capture, analyze over and over and over again. So. You're going to see the con consolidated version of this. You know, uh, I found finally found packets that were successful, and it actually works out really well for this uh, demonstration. But it, it took a lot of work. I was doing it over and over again, and you will have that experience if you're doing this yourself. So, doing our research, starting with our reconnaissance. I talked about how. Uh, the ICS Village has provided me with Phoenix Contact Radios, uh, the type of which that you will find within an ICS environment. You can see that on the left-hand side, that is a the client radio. And on the right-hand side, we have a, a, a module that does uh, do just digital I.O. I have it disconnected. That's why there's that space there. I'm actually just sending serial communications. The radio will take serial input. So I just created a... a, a a serial connection using screen, sent data out, and this transmitted it from the client radio to the managing radio. 
and I just captured it on the other side. Okay. But in order to understand how to capture it, I had to go through the process of doing reconnaissance. How is this transmitting? What is it? What frequencies is it transmitting on? How is it packaging the data? To start with that, I didn't even open up my radio boxes. I, I didn't even open up initially the manual. I just went out to the Phoenix Contact website, started reviewing the information about the radio there. From that, I got the FCC ID and I was able to determine, and you can see on the right-hand side, the uh, images of the radios and the microcontrollers within that device. That comes from the FCC documentation. And, and we've talked about this before when we've given, when multiple people have given talks on this. From that analysis, I determined I, I actually grabbed some uh, additional information from the website, uh, did some frequency analysis. You know, it's the 900 megahertz range. The, it does do frequency hopping. We can see the modulation there. Typically in these types of environments, it's going to be the FSK, but you know, it's, it really depends on how the uh, radios are implemented. Uh, from there, I, under, I gather information about how the radio is transmitting talk about the preamble, you're going to see that later, which is just a way that the radio says that I am com transmitting uh, and how the radio tells it can receive a signal as if it sees, starts seeing the preamble. And then also the sync word is important. This will be radio specific, but can be configured by the developers. So it could be different. But the sync word is just a way to say that, hey, we are about to start a packet. The packet starts here. And when data is being passed from radio to radio, it's actually the radios that are using the preamble and the sync word. When the data is coming out of the radio, it doesn't include that information. But we're going to see it in the packets in the transmissions. And then obviously, we need to ensure that we have gotten proper transmission of the information. And so most radios are going to use some type of uh, cyclic redundancy check. And that could be processed by the radio itself, or it could be done by the application that's receiving the information. So equipment. So our next step was to, now we understand about the radios and what, we're, what we need to do to interact with the, those transmissions. In this case, we're going to, when we're picking our equipment, we're going to use the universal radio hacker. We started talking about that earlier. And we're also going to use a hack RF1. And so the hack RF1 is a, a, a radio that is, it's an open source radio. It's uh, created by a great Scott's gadgets, the team over there. Um, and the, it's an excellent radio. It's uh, relatively cheap, only about a little over $300 to get into the, to get into this but it makes nice clean captures for analysis and you'll see that in just a second. Uh, we're gonna use that hardware and interact with that hardware using the Universal Radio Hacker, which is just a package that is built on top of the GNU Radio Companion and it makes it a lot easier to capture, analyze, uh, store these uh, data transmission. Right there on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm using the PEEP PIP ENV environment to actually build all of this. And I highly recommend that you use that to build the Universal Radio Hacker. It makes it relatively easy. Probably the only caveat that I want to say there is that you can see I'm installing Cython and at the same time as URH. You want to install Cython before URH or you will get an error. It, it requires that package before it builds. And from what I can tell, PIP ENV does. Uh, install packages in order that you put them on the command line so be sure to put that in there you know ipython is nice i like to have that rfcat is used by universal radio hacker to uh, to transmit but you can use that on the side uh, as well uh, and then just interacting being able to interact with serial ports uh, usb and modbus uh, i just included that because it could potentially be a part of this project okay now we're going to get into the actual analysis, so capture and, and analysis of the information. Uh, and you know, the part I'm skipping here is that you you know you, you start the URH, you create a project, and so forth. And it's relatively easy. I didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, we've got a lot to cover in just a, a, a few more minutes. So you know, uh, please take some time to set that up yourself. 
but just assume that I've already created a, a project. You'll see it. I've named it demo. If you're downloading it from the uh, Cutaway Security website, it will be the demo project, and you'll just be able to open that project up when you start URH. But once you've got that up and running, URH up and running, and you've also attached your HackRF radio, make sure you attach your antenna before you power it. You definitely want to do that. You're going to set up a project. The project's going to have some defaults. And as you can see here, I've set those defaults up, the frequency, sample rate, and bandwidth. I picked 925 mega, 925 megahertz just because I had already done my analysis. I knew I'm going to get a transmission on there, but you're going to have to find a starting point yourself and it's going to be slightly different. But fortunately, when you are open up the spectrum analysis window, and that's what we're going to do first to locate a signal, once you have all this configuration and you start your interactions with the HackRF radio, uh, you're going to be seeing broadcasts. And those are the spikes that we see there. And you'll see that in just a second when we click over to, to do the active GIF. But each one of those spikes is a transmission. And you can see that even though I'm set on 925, you can see transmissions that are just off to the left and the right of my center frequency. And that's the frequency hopping that you're seeing. So when we say that the radio is transmitting on the 900 megahertz range and it's frequency hopping to different areas, that's what you're seeing in the display on the right-hand side of that. Okay, And if you need to, even if you start at off-center, what's uh, great about URH is that you can just click inside that window, inside that FFT, and it will recenter that frequency onto wherever you click. So you can actually center everything up just by clicking on it. All right, so our first demonstration is locating the traffic. Basically, I've uh, connected my HackRF radio. I will uh, clear this so that I can see the spikes. And I'm just really trying to find an area where the transmissions are. And since it's frequency hopping, I want to get center frequency on just one of those hops. I'm not concerned about all of them. I just want to uh, capture one hop off of a center frequency. And it's going to make it, if I center up the, the capture, and then it's going to make it a lot easier for analysis, and you'll see that in just a moment, right? So we've, I, we've I lo located our transmissions. From there, the next thing we do is we want to record those transmissions. So we're going to use the uh, record signal window to do our actual capture. In our other window, we were just locating it. That doesn't capture any data, and so we don't have to worry about this. In this one, we're going to record our signal, and we can see it has the same type of configuration settings, those actually come over. So if you'd recentered your radio on a specific frequency, you don't have to remember all of those numbers. If you just go from the analysis window over to the record window, it should uh, bring that information, those uh, configuration settings over for you. Okay, and then as you can see on the uh, um, right-hand side of the window, instead of having the uh, water or the uh, the normal FFT like we had in the last window, we're actually seeing uh, transmissions over time. And so from you know going from left to right will be our different broadcasts. And so each one of those spikes is a different transmission. It will be capturing, it won't just capture just the center freak transmission. You will be capturing things that are slightly to the left and the right associated with your bandwidth that you've configured your radio to listen to. Okay, so let's see an example of that. I'm just going to go ahead and configure my radio. If you had a, an RTL SDR, that's where you, you would just select your device and, and then reconfigure all of the settings. I just use the default for the Hack RF, the way that URH set it up. And then I just hit start. And then once I hit start, I can see that I'm actually uh, capturing transmissions. You can see the samples, how many samples that you've captured on the bottom left-hand side. You can actually see the size of the file as well uh, and you want to monitor that to make sure you don't fill your disk up you can you know uh, monitor for monitor for too long once you have that you're going to want to save this capture off what's great about urh is it automatically puts your configuration information into the file name you 
you're going to need that information in case you want to do offline analysis later on down the line. It's nice to know the center frequency that you captured on everything on, but what's more important is this one right here, which is your sample rate, so samples per second. You do need to understand that if you're going to do your future analysis, it, it just makes it a lot easier. And then obviously the uh, the file extension that you saw there is associated with the size of the data that's being captured output. Different radios are going to have different sizes, the, the bytes associated with each sample. And uh, you saw the one that's associated with the HackRF, but if you're using RTL-SDR or Lime, S, uh, Lime SDR or one of the other radios, that might be slightly different. So after we capture, and as you can see, we're going pretty fast. That's why I put the resources up online so that you guys can walk through and, and see, see this analysis and do this at your own speed as we're going forward. Okay. Uh, so now what we've done is we've located a signal and we've captured it. Right. And once we have that capture, we can start doing our analysis. And that's what the Universal Radio Hacker is specialized in doing. It's going to allow us to take that transmission and try to get from the uh, the wave that we captured, the transmission that we captured, to the actual bit stream. Okay. To do this, uh, once we have a capture, we are we close all of our windows. We cl close the uh, the the radio capture window, and then we're going to have our capture. We can see it on the left hand side of our window right here. And we're going to pull that, and you're going to see me do it in just a second. We're going to pull that into our interpretation tab on the right-hand side. Okay. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to interact with all of those transmissions that we captured. It's going to have that full capture. Okay. Uh, but the first thing that we want to do is we want to adjust the noise. All right. If we are using a radio or we have a... Uh, uh, if we're using a radio such as an RTL SDR, it, while it's a decent radio for beginnings, if when you're beginning in this uh, type of activity, it's not necessarily a very good radio. You don't get a very clean signal out of it. But what happens is is that you can you can fix that. You can attempt to fix that using software, and that's what you know URH the software defined radio is going to assist you to do. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to look at the noise that was picked up and try to reduce that as much as possible so we have a cleaner signal and hopefully get better data out of that signal. The red line that you see through the middle of this, that's actually the noise calculation. So we're going to adjust that red line. And what that red line is, is that's telling URH how much information to ignore from the signal. Okay. And as you can see, we have a, a large spike here, so we still should have some data that's associated with that signal, and hopefully we'll be able to analyze that. But if we're not careful, if we say that there's too much noise, we could actually be hiding some of the transmissions and those smaller lines on the right-hand side. Hopefully you can see my mouse circling it. If we configured our noise right here, we would actually be masking that transmission and that might be something that we want. So we want to adjust our noise very carefully. Uh, and you're going to see that the uh, HackRF radio actually gets a very, does do a very, very clean capture. Even though I'm going to adjust things, I'm actually going to take it back to the original settings because the transmissions, the, the capture with the HackRF radio was good. So let's go ahead and see that capture. So I'm, right now I'm just pulling the, uh, radio capture into my interpretation windows. I'm checking my noise configuration and some of my other settings. We want to leave our center at zero for now. You'll see us change that later. Our sample rate, our samples per symbol, we'll make that adjustment later on. But uh, right now I want to concentrate on the noise. You can zoom in and out on your signal by uh, using your mouse wheel and get a little bit closer, but you can also adjust the uh, adjustment to the Y scale and get really close to that, some, to that signal so that we can see the noise a little bit better. If this had been an RTL SDR, you'd have seen a, a lot of information there that we probably would, would want to adjust. If we're going to this noise, we're going to want to get as close as possible. In other words, if we're going to cut out a part of the signal that 
that we don't want to, as a part of our computations, we don't want to cut out too much. So we want to get our noise configuration just enough so that it's so that we can continue our analysis. But as I mentioned, we're for the HackRF, I'm just going to leave the settings as default settings. Uh, I'm not worried about it in this case. And you'll see that we have a nice clean signal, a nice clean capture in the next slide. So next we want to isolate our transmission. In other words, we have a capture that has, I mean, let's just count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, you know, almost 16 transmissions. Actually, if you drilled into it, there's probably more transmissions. Those single lines are probably uh, transmissions, uh, multiple transmissions that are really close to each other. And that's a part of what I found with my uh, uh, analysis is that one radio would transmit and the other would, radio would re respond very, very quickly. So you actually might have multiple transmissions in there that you just don't realize because we haven't zoomed in on it yet. And that's, that's what we're gonna do. So we're going to try to isolate a single transmission so we can do our analysis on that. Uh, we're going to use the hacker, or excuse me, the universal hacker radio capabilities to do that. You can see the blue line at the top, and you'll get the demonstration in just a second. But you can see the blue line at the top of the uh, in the top signal here, and I can just highlight that with my mouse, drag it across, and select a. And you're actually selecting the a time frame of that signal. Okay, and so I can select a single signal. In this case, uh, it comes out to a signal signal. And then, then once I've selected it, I'll just right click on it and then select the create signal from selection option. And what that does is that creates the signal down here below. In other words, this wasn't here below before. It actually creates a, uh, a new signal down here so that I can do an analysis within this window on that single signal, okay? I can change all of my configuration settings. I can adjust noise if I need to, my center, as you'll see in a moment, but I can just work on this one sig signal and I won't, I'm not making modifications to all of my other transmissions, okay? And if you needed to, and, and you're actually gonna see me doing it in just a moment, you can cut out a lot of the uh, extra signals and concentrate on that in other words you're going to cut out a lot of the extra information the extraneous information that we don't need as a part of our analysis to analyze this signal I and mean, you're just going to use the tool to crop to to crop the information that you're doing analysis on in just a second uh, we're also going to modify some of our settings as you can see we've we've got a signal that is being transmitted but it's in our analog view as I'm analyzing the information, I want to demodulate that signal. And so we can see in our signal view that we've demodulated it. And then later on, we're going to adjust the bits so that it's visually representing the information that's being transmitted to us and try to look, for, we'll try to visually look for some patterns there. So, so you'll see not only me adjusting and cropping out a single signal from this, cropping that signal down so I don't have a lot of extra information, but I'll also be adjusting the modulation so that we can see if we have a clean signal. So that's what we're seeing here. Just using the mouse to select a signal, you can, it's very easy to select and crop out a signal signal. And once I have that signal down in the new window, I can actually crop out a lot of the extra information which just helps helps with my processing of the signal or at least it helps the urh in my mind process it and then when i change to my demodulated signal i can actually see this what i expect to see as far as a transmission and you can see the transitions going as a part of that signal which is the representation of the information okay once I have that, uh, once I have configured the signal, you can see that I was slightly off center. So I've, I've selected a signal to do analysis on, 
and um, I'm focusing my an analysis on that one single transmission. When I demodulated it, typically I would expect that transmission to be on my center line. So when you saw within the tool, you saw the two different colors, red and green, green on the top and red on the bottom. That was that line between the two colors is your center line. And so that should be your center of your transmission when we were capturing at the 925 megahertz. You, we would expect the transmission to be there. But because we're capturing the frequency hoppings, the things that are to the left and the right of our setter frequency, it doesn't mean that we can't do analysis on that. And the way we do that analysis is we adjust that center line. So uh, when we go and see the GIF in just a second, you're going to see how I just select that center line. You can either adjust it in the by adjusting the numbers here for the center setting, but you can also adjust, grab the center line with your mouse and pull that up to the location that you want. What we're going to do there is you're going to see me moving that center line up and down until I get it in the middle of the signal. In other words, you're going to have your center line should be your transition from your waveform, and you should have as much of this signal on top of it as you do below it. And we can use some of the uh, signal transitions to help us achieve that center. In other words, if it's not crossing and not going all the way down to the bottom of our signal, we can see this here. If it's not going all the way to the bottom there, I can adjust my spikes so that the spikes coming down and the spikes going up, I, I get it right between those two. And so you're going to see me doing that. After we do that, after we center it up, we also need to, what we're going to see is we're going to see our data representation down in our our signal view window we're going to see that modify and it's going to actually change to a representation of the bits within that transmission it's not going to be correct but we're going to you know i want you to notice that that changes as we modify the center line from there uh, once i have the cent center in the position that i want it then we're going to analyze this signal as well we're going to zoom in on the signal and try to find the rate of change. In other words, our symbols per second. And we're going to do that by focusing in on a single transition from of the waveform across that center line. And I'm going to get the time. As you can see, the time right here is 32 uh, microseconds. But I'm going to actually get the time for a single part of that wave. In other words, on top of it. And that's going to be my symbols per second. Okay, and I'm going to take that data and I'm going to put that into my samples per uh, uh, symbol. And you're going to see from there that I get a representation of the data that was transmitted. So here I'm just moving my center line up to the center of the transmission. I'll zoom in on that, get a little bit closer so I can do my analysis. So I'll modify my Y scale. I'll make the, the waveform a little bit bigger and then use my scroll, mouse scroll wheel to zoom in on that. I'll adjust it slightly so that it's uh, in the center of the signal, or at least as close as I can get it visually. And then I'll move to the portion of the signal that's the preamble, because that's going to have my uh, fastest rate of change. You want to find the fastest rate of change to help you understand your symbols per or your samples per sim symbol. Now I'm just going to use the capabilities of my mouse to select a time frame associated with that symbol as we can see that that is 16 microseconds i'll select the full waveforms to ensure that i've got a good representation of the symbol for the full waveform it was 32 and then i'm just going to adjust i'm going to take that 16 and i'm adjust that samples per symbol and what's going to happen is we're going to see the data in our data view change Okay, now these are, these are the bits that, uh, from the symbols that were represented. And then we'll, uh, ch if we change that to hex, we can see some information and we can actually see a preambles, which were the A's that we talked about, and also the sync word. Also, because I'm transmitting an ASCII, if I change the ASCII view, you can see that I transmitted just the, the, the words cutaway smash. Okay. So now we actually have taken our waveform and we've converted it into a bit stream, which is actually a packet that we expected. And that was off center 
So that was one of our transmissions that wasn't on our sender frequency. We were still able to capture and analyze that information. Okay. Now that we have a representation of that uh, information, we want to do some additional analysis. Our preamble and our sync word, you can be slightly off with this, and we're just going to crop our signal a little bit to understand whether or not uh, um, we've got a good signal. Right now, I have a good signal, so this was a good transmission for our example. But if I chop off a portion of that, if I chop to even just one bit off of the very beginning of that, and we'll see that here, the data actually changes. And we'll see that it changes, everything changes to from A's to fives, okay? Doesn't mean I have bad data. It just means that the, the window that's displaying the information to me is displaying what it sees and what it's interpreting, and it's just slightly off. So I need to make adjustments to my analysis to, uh, to compensate for that. If I cut another bit off, we'll see that uh, the data, the sync word is actually different. It actually, the way it's represented the data, it's not that B4 to B that we expected. And I just need to continue doing this analysis, chopping those bits off. Once I have that information, and I know we're going fast, but we've only got a few minutes and I'm trying to get through it all for you, for all of you. And I appreciate your patience with that. Okay, so we do our analysis. Once we have what we think is a good transmission, uh, we saw that preamble. We also see the, the sync word that we expect to see. Then we're going to do our packet field identification. And this is one of the strong points associated with URH. We can actually take that information that, the, that came out of the signal, that data representation, and pull it into our analysis window. And once it's in our analysis window, it gives us a representation. And depending on the configuration, I've got it as I'm viewing the data as hex. And we're going to see it, that in each one of our fields, we have a nibble that, of that packet that is displayed in the display field. So each one of those nibbles, I can select that and label those associated with what, is, what it is in that, that signal. Uh, so the, the first thing that we select is our preamble. So we know our preamble is just, you know, hey, I'm transmitting something, telling the radio to start listening. Then we can configure the synchronization. So the sync word, which is the B42B, we know that because of our radio analysis. That's just telling the radio that, hey, this is for you. And also here's where your packet starts. From there, we can do th other things such as the length. And as we understand more about the radio and, and the, its implementation, we can also configure things about the data packet itself. For here, I've figured out that those two bytes starting at 15 and the byte at 15 is the sequence number. We also have the device ID representation in there, so the, the device that sent it. And we have the radio, the network ID which is configured, we get that from our configuration files that we had before. We are also gonna check the, do the checksum. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward, but you know, if, if you look at the video, you'll see that you can, what we'll do is from the length, we'll count down to where the checksum for the packet is, and we can do some computations on that and allow URH to help us understand whether or not we have a good checksum, okay? The reason why this is important, okay? So what we've done is we've taken a, sing a signal, we've captured it. We actually ca captured it off of our a hop that wasn't as part of our center frequency and did analysis and went from that signal to the bytes that were transmitted. And this slide right here is a representation of that information. The very bottom, as we can see, the, our unencrypted bytes, that equates to the cutaway smash, that's the serial transmissions that I did before, sent in plain text. So sent with the radios configured, not for encryption, all right? The packets above this, however, are the encryption. So I went back and I did all of this and configured the radios to do encryption, and we can see that there is a change in the data. So this is actually, I believe, encrypting the information it, it's what we would expect, okay? 
And so if we are confirming for somebody that they have implemented this correctly and uh, implemented that the a vendor has is indeed encrypting the information, we have validated that uh, within this setup right here. There are still some questions, however, you know, the encrypted bytes, I believe that we have 24 bytes right there. We'd have to do some confirmation on that, but that would be for our additional um, continued analysis. And, you know, uh, that's what I want to talk about right here. Some interesting f facts about encryption. We do know that these radios are doing 128-bit data encryption, AES. But when we think about that, you know, I, I, start, I start thinking about the radios, you know, how is that being implemented? Is it being implemented by the application or is it actually being implemented by the radios? Because the radio components can do that themselves. But we, but we see here through data sheet analysis that the radios and the microcontrollers on that, within that device do not provide on-chip encryption. And therefore that means the application is doing some type of encryption. So we need to start looking at that. But there's so many questions. I talked about this with, I kind of reviewed this with Josh Wright. And that's the first thing he said to me is like, I have questions. I was like, I have questions too. The, the way that they're implementing AES is confusing. You know, the, the data that I sent was 12 byte longs, but the 12 bytes long, but the encrypted data was 24 bytes. It doesn't really make sense. They're doing something with their encryption. And it's going to take a lot more analysis to understand how they're padding, what type of uh, what type of mode they're using for AES. Are they sending? Are they using an initialization vector now? Are they sending it? And so forth. There is more just than more to that than just uh, analyzing how they're doing encryption. Uh, we see management packets that aren't encrypted, and so forth. And so there, there's still a lot of analysis to understand how the vendors actually implementing that within their implementation. And I see Jordan and Kent popping on. Are you uh, are you giving me a double you pat? About one more minute. Go on. Okay, uh, excellent. Yeah. So I would uh, I would continue my analysis from there. And this is just kind of talking about what I would need to do for a client or personally interested in i would continue my radio analysis i would continue modifying the values that i'm transmitting and sending and capturing and doing it over and over and over again to really to understand this technology so in conclusion you know we can do radio analysis frequency hopping is not going to prevent us from capturing information from doing analysis on it from interacting with the radios Eventually, I would take all of this information and start transmitting on those frequencies and trying to have an impact on that process or, or within that organization and that implementation. Here's all my references. This is a part of the slides that are online that you can download at Cutaway Security. And you can do all the research yourself. Once again, my name's Don Weber. I appreciate everybody's time. You know, I know you're going to have a lot of questions. I, I Fortunately, I'm on site with a client, so I can't stick around Discord to answer those questions, but you can always reach out to me at my uh, contact information right there. And huge shout out to Thomas Van Norman and ICS Village. This would not have been possible without them. So gentlemen, I know I'm pushing right up against my time. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Black Hills and Wild West Hacking Fest for this. Yes, sir. Thank you. We have one quick question. And awesome. hopefully it can be quick. Does the latest version of Control Things have Universal Radio Hacker? It does. And we are updating that package right now. But in, in the last version, and the new version might be up now, but in the last version, it definitely was on there. We use it. We actually use it in our class to do these things. Dave Fletcher was with me at one of the classes. And we do transmissions and captures live in the class. So you would do all of this. And that's what inspired me to do this on actual devices that are deployed in there. So it does have it in there. I think David Fletcher has been with someone at every single <laughs> class at some point in his career. Hey, he, he rocks. I was, I was so happy to have him in there. He helped me so much. Uh, and, and people in the class, you know, he's real joy to be, be around as there with, is um, no so joke. Yeah. He's, he's one of the best guys there ever was. There's no doubt. Absolutely. Thank you, Don, so much for Thanks, your presentation Don. today. I really appreciate it. It was fast. 
please go check out the resources and reach reach out. I know I just freaking flew through that, but you know it's something I really <laughs> wanted to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Take Thanks, care, Don. sir. Have a great All right, morning. have a great day, everybody, hey. and be safe. Bye.